So today's topic is visual st storytelling, uh, the power of volunteer stories. And so, um, you know, for those of you that, uh, that you know, I've never met before, uh, my name is Gung Wong. I'm the CEO and co-founder here at Civic Champs. Um, we've been around for about four years now and work with uh, nonprofits across the country and provide volunteer management software uh, for, for, for nonprofits and their champions. Um, this is a couple fun stats about me on the right in terms of my education and career, uh, but I love volunteering. That's why I'm in this space. And um, obviously, I'm sort of, I feel like I'm preaching the choir, but obviously you all are uh, in the space probably for very similar reasons, right? I think it's uh, one of the few ways that brings our communities together, right, in a very positive way. So uh, but today, our topic is around visual storytelling, and I'm super, super excited to introduce Natalie, who's going to be our guest speaker for the day. Uh, she's the Community Engagement Manager at Memory Fox. Um, and so, uh, you know, previously, Natalie was in the nonprofit sector as well, uh, working, uh, I think, most recently with uh, Farmer Veteran Coalition, if I'm correct, um, which inspired a lot of, uh, you know, why she was excited about Memory Fox. I'll let her dig into that more. Um, she, of course, like all of us, does a bunch of volunteering too. Uh, and so with that, yeah, let me kick it over to Natalie. If you want to say hi and introduce yourself. Yeah, so wonderful. Thank you, Gung, for the introduction. Wonderful to be here with you all and see so many faces on this call together. Um, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you're tuning in from. I'm West Coast, so it's still morning over here, but I know of you, some of you have transferred into that afternoon hour. Uh, but really just so jazzed to be here with you all today, especially on National Nonprofit Day, which is really thrilling. Um, I'd love to hear how you're feeling. How? What, tell me in one word in the chat what you're feeling today. Let's just kind of set the mood and take our temperatures and and, um, I'm going to start us off with a with a little journey back in time to a couple decades ago when I went on my first emergent service trip. And this was back in high school. Um, you can see here the Fort Apache Native American Reservation, as I mentioned in my volunteer work. And I went with a dozen other students and spent a week doing some really incredible work on the Fort Apache Native American Reservation in eastern Arizona. And during our time there, we restored structures, we repaired damage, um, we spent a lot of time with kids on the reservation in their schools. But really the most unexpected moment came at the very end of our trip when the natives invited us into their sacred sweat lodge ritual. And I'll tell you, being huddled inside this sweat lodge ritual is really one of my tr most treasured moments of life, even still to this day. Um, you can see how small that little crawl space is to get in. I don't know the the like proportions aren't really totally showing it, but you had to crawl on your hands and knees to get into this hut. And we were sardined in shoulder to shoulder and shin to shin. Um, but for hours, we sat in that hut in total darkness. They poured water on the hot lava rocks inside coming from the fire outside that you see there. Um, and chants reverberated, they beat drums. We shared our own personal stories and recounted some of our own personal struggles. Um, we meditated, and I'll tell you mostly what we did is we sweated profusely, but this whole ceremony was so cleansing and healing and really spiritually moving um, to the point that I still feel it so strongly today. And I share all this just because um, this service trip is one of my earliest memories of volunteer work that I did that felt particularly meaningful to me. And I felt a connection to the land, and I also felt a connection to the people of the land. So I just wanted to set the stage and start off by saying thank you to each and every one of you for the work that you do to make moments like this for volunteers to be able to connect to your mission in a really meaningful way. So today we're going to talk about visual storytelling um, and the power that videos and photos have to not only engage your donors, but also your volunteers and your community on a whole. I'm going to start us off with this quote. You miss 100% of the shots that you don't take. So back in January, I spoke on a panel where the closing question they asked the panelists was, what slogan do you live by? And this is what I said, this great quote by the great one, Wayne Gretzky, or actually by Michael Scott, as my team likes to remind me that it's really an office quote. Um, and while I love this quote, after that panel, I got to thinking about it and I started to wonder, like, why is that my life motto? Because it didn't always start this way. Back in my youth, I played softball. And while I generally loved playing sports, I was really terrible at softball. I struck out all the time. I did not have confidence fielding the ball. 
Uh, and then <laughs> there were those really dreaded moments when I was stationed at third base toward the end of a game that dragged on for hours with no chance to leave the base to run to the bathroom. And I was wearing white pants. And so after several tear-filled games when I felt like I just couldn't hit the ball and I was failing, my softball days quickly became numbered and I quit. So after striking out so often back then and quitting the sport, how did I come to embrace this notion that you miss 100% of the shots that you don't take? And really when I started to trace it back, I realized it was tied to this internship that I had in college at UC Davis. So there I worked for the Aggie Pack which was the largest student-run spirit organization in the country. And we did all the in-game promotions. Now, here's the gold. I worked under the incredible leadership of three humans who encouraged us to dream big. And I distinctly um, have it ingrained in me that for these three, no idea was too outlandish. They would say, throw your wildest creative ideas out there and let's see if we can make them happen, no matter how crazy they might seem. They really discouraged all of us from self-limiting our thoughts and from giving ourselves a no, that's not possible before we even explored the potential of a yes. And you know, the craziest thing we did that year, we bought a fire truck. We bought this fire truck. We painted it with our school colors. We branded it with our school logo. And that fire truck became almost like a secondary mascot for the school. And so our Aggie Pack group would take it, like would drive it onto the team's football field to kick off all the pregame festivities with the sirens blaring. And we blasted tube socks and burritos and t-shirts out of slingshots and, um, you know, propelling guns out of the truck and into the crowd of students. And that was something that I was incredibly proud to be a part of. And ultimately, I'm just thankful for these people early in my formative years who encouraged me to dream big. Um, and take those wild shots because it really is the best feeling when they hit. Now, you're all probably wondering, okay, how does this tie to visual storytelling and our volunteer work? And we're going to get there. But before I get into how I applied this in my own nonprofit work, I would love to hear from all of you in the chat. When you hear visual storytelling, what does that mean to you? Go ahead, let me know. What does visual storytelling, what kind of things do you think about tied to visual storytelling? What does that term mean to you? And I'm going to move forward and share a little bit about as I landed in a nonprofit um, starting in 2019, and I'll come back to some of these great answers that you guys are putting in the chat here. Um, but as I started my journey into the nonprofit world in 2019, I joined this wonderful organization called Farmer Veteran Coalition that helps veterans pursue careers in agriculture. And it was really powerful to write these stories of men and women who served our country once defending it and now serving it a second time and feeding it. And I started my storytelling journey there. Um, I headed up all of our communications and marketing, and that was just simply putting words on paper, you know, paper in the greater sense of paper, meaning like online paper as well. Um, but written story about our members and talking about their time in the military and now what they're doing farming. But I'll tell you, after a year of doing that, I really wanted a different way to tell story. And all of a sudden, that experimentation mindset from my Aggie Pack days came back into my mind. And so I decided to start experimenting in the form of storytelling. And I thought, what if I dabbled with visual storytelling, doing it in a way that isn't strictly words on paper? And so that next year, we were actually celebrating our 12-year anniversary. And so we journeyed back through each year, one day at a time, um, over 12 days, one year per day, and we shared great photos we had taken ourselves, and it was a really fun walk back down memory lane. And then a couple months later, I compiled a great photo slideshow of, um, we have a handful of grantees that we award a piece of farm equipment to that would make a difference on their farms. And so instead of just listing them as names on a text web page, like we historically did, it became a really great way to show a collection of faces. And so I pulled photos from their websites and their social channels and made a really beautiful slideshow. And these were all a step better than written um, collections. But at the same time, this still wasn't being shared by our community and not in a way that engaged them in conversation. They were really just these passive subjects. And so that ultimately led to this idea of what if instead of doing this passively, I elevated our community voices and allowed them to share story in their own words or allowed them to submit a picture to me and shared their story in their own um, picture form. 
So I'm kind of curious, like I'm going to take a pause here and I want to know, are any of you experimenting with this? Who has done some form, shape, size, and form of this, of sharing photos, collecting videos, um, either regularly or just experimenting it with the first time uh, to see what it can be like to collect some of these stories directly from your community and their own voices? Okay, I see Sarah has her hand raised. Lots of pictures, form on your website. Okay, that's excellent. Jason, love to hear that. Carly, love that as well. Well, I'm going to... Um, attempt to highlight a little bit how I attempted this with three campaigns. That's wonderful, Sue. Love to hear that you do that via your volunteer newsletter. What a fantastic tie-in. So um, a couple of years ago, I first tried to get some of these video testimonies in um, remembrance of the 20th anniversary of 9-11. And as you can imagine, for many of our members, veterans, this was such a pivotal day for them. Either it is the reason they joined the military or it completely changed their, their trajectory of their career. Um, and so I put out a call just asking them to recount what that day meant to them. And I ended up getting seven videos in return, which it still made a very impactful piece, but was less than I expected just with 30,000 members across the country. I was kind of anticipating a lot more participation. So I felt a little personally disappointed and falling short of what I thought, but also loved the opportunity to get to share their voices with everybody in our ecosystem. Then two months later on Veterans Day, our team decided rather than use Veterans Day as a day to fundraise money, we chose to use it as a day to celebrate our collective members' time of service. Now, look, I could have decided right there that our community, community doesn't like to engage with requests, that they're too busy um, or they're too difficult to get to them, or they just simply don't want to share. I could have really talked myself out of that reverting back to my softball mentality of cold quitting, but I didn't. I had this really grand vision of a photo wall, a photo collection of all these members in uniform. And I was hoping if I could collect a hundred pictures, which I thought I could do, it would make a really nice page. So I put out this email request and I was totally blown away when I got 800 photos in return overwhelmed in the most wonderful way to be able to celebrate so many members, but also overwhelmed trying to process them all, process them, process them all over two days. Uh, this kind of became my own version of that fire truck, something totally larger than life and, and unexpected. Um, but when I thought back on what made this so successful in terms of participation, I realized it's because it was a really easy request. So these members all have these photos on their phone, at their fingertips. All they had to do was just reply to that email, attach it, and send it off. And ultimately, I was meeting them where they were. So making something that was easy for them to participate in. Yeah, one. I know, Jason, I've been there. I feel you. It just it takes finding that right moment of what's going to connect with the people in your community. Um, and I'll tell you, aside from getting to make this very beautiful collection of photos and share it with um, everybody, our members, our donors, our followers, our staff, et cetera, the best part was this. It was that hundreds of them, like literally hundreds of them, when they sent the email back, said, thank you for recognizing us on Veterans Day. Thank you for making this day about what it's supposed to be about. And so I felt like not only could we do this really beautiful web page, but also it was a start, a beginning of helping our members feel seen and heard. And ultimately, that's what it's all about, right? We're here to serve the people that we work with. So last example, to just paint my background, um, later that month was Giving Tuesday. And as that rolled around, we, our team decided to use Giving Tuesday as a day of gratitude as we entered the full giving season for the last month of the year. Um, and the idea here was going back to those grantees that we, warm a, that we award farm equipment to. Um, I asked them if they would film a very short video on their farm in front of that piece of farm equipment with it behind them, telling us how it um, how it made their operation more efficient and giving a little thank you message. And, you know, once again, I felt a bit of anxiety just even asking the question, knowing how much of an inconvenience it could be with these members so tied up in farm duties all day. Um, but once again, what overwhelmed me was not only the response from donors upon hearing these videos be shared, but it was actually the response from the members as they sent them in to me. They were so enthusiastic to film it. And so many of them said, thank you for the chance to say thank you. And that just, that was something I, I never could have even imagined in my wildest dreams, getting a thank you for the opportunity to say thank you. 
Ultimately, I wonder if that first video piece from 9-11 kind of nurtured the seeds that ultimately showed more people how they could participate. Sometimes it takes giving them that example, that visual example to know what they can do the next time. Um, but really, it reminds me of this wonderful quote by Maya Angelou. There is no greater agony than bearing an untold story inside of you. And so really, these members had a message they wanted to share with our community, and we just had to give them that right moment to do it. <clears throat> Okay, I'm gonna pause for a moment. I'm gonna go back and touch on some of what you all said about visual storytelling. I saw a lot of things about video, photos, um, a picture speaks a thousand words. Yes, that's wonderful. Something that puts you there, setting images into viewers' memory. Yeah, communicating impact through pictures and videos. Lots of social media reels, photo, like I'm seeing a lot of video, photo, video, and a picture is worth a thousand words. Wonderful, thank you all for sharing those. Um. I, so many of what you guys said here, that that has always historically been my idea of video storytelling, just showing something, so showing somebody's journey represented through a photo or a video form. And I'll tell you, um, when I came on and joined the Memory Fox team in December, after meeting them at the nonprofit storytelling conference last fall, um, you can see me here with my lovely Carly, who you, lovely colleague, colleague Carly, who you see in the chat. Um, she and I actually started one day apart, which is super fun. But um, when they showed me their tool, when I met them in the fall, my jaw just hit the floor and I had no idea something like this existed. And I think back, especially to that 800 collection of photos that came in and how much easier it would have been to process with a tool versus in my email inbox. Um, but ultimately, now having been with the team for eight going on nine months, I am now um, talking storytelling every day with nonprofits. I've started to realize that that um, visual storytelling can go beyond just a single person and what their journey and what their storytelling is story um, story is. It's really more encompassing of all the facets of your mission and everything that your organization does. So visual storytelling can be showing what you do. It can be educating people in your ecosystem. Um, it can be sharing your programs and their impact and why it's so important to continue them. And I think it's so relevant to this community here because a big piece of this is sharing that story with not only your existing followers and donors and your team, but also all your vo volunteers, the people who are there, who are advocates on your behalf and want to help you tell why like, it's so compelling to them to participate in your programs and your work and your events. Um, but ultimately, we live and breathe this mission every day. Our community does not. And so I think it's so easy for us to fall on this trap of assuming people know all the work that our organization is doing, but often they don't. Um, and so sometimes it's not about trying to go out and get new, like recruit new people to join you. It's more about how are we fostering that growth within our organization with the people who are already tied into us and tuned into us? How are we highlighting those stories of impact and finding ways to share those? So I know that can feel a bit daunting. Raise your hand if that does feel daunting to you. Um, I think there's lots of questions around like, how do I even go about doing this? How do we display that impact? Who do we collect it from? Um, do we need to interview somebody? Does it need to be this like big produced piece and look super polished um, or can it be more raw? And then ultimately, where do I share it? Who am I sharing it with? Um, how do we get the money to collect these stories? So really for the rest of our time together now, what I wanna do is just touch on some of those ideas to talk about how you all can do that um, with different types of stories within your nonprofit and share a few successful examples we've seen from our customers as it ties to their volunteer outreach to show you some real tangible ways that people are doing this well. Um, and then I'll come full circle, full circle at the end and just share some great um, tips for best practice that we've seen. Okay, so um, this is some really like wonderful collection of ways we've seen people in the nonprofit world share their story to honor community that goes above and beyond just a single journey. So certainly this can help with your volunteer recruitment and volunteer retention by getting your, your volunteers to share stories of what they're doing and see themselves reflected back in that mission. Um, definitely helping with engagement. So that can be um, just like, again, what, like I was saying, ways for the people who are already part of your ecosystem to feel like they are recognized and seen and heard. 
Events are a really great way, especially in-person events to be able to collect right there on the spot. But even virtual events is another opportunity for you to have people just take a selfie of where they're tuning in from for the event, or like maybe they're doing some work on the ground from that event and send it into you so you can show the whole collection in its widespread form. Program impact, of course, I think is pretty self-explanatory, but just collecting testimony from people who've participated in your programs or volunteers who are helping run it, um, even engaging civic leaders and representatives with some explainer videos of these are our programs, and this is why it's really important that they can that they continue. Um, and then around grants, we've seen some really great collections. So people have used uh, the video to show the impact of the work that they're doing as a result of a grant that they've received. They've also taken those videos and then used in, them in their application to apply for and secure future grants. Um, and then the other thing tied to grants is for if you're an organization that gives out a grant as part of your or like a scholarship as part of your programming, um, we've seen people instead of asking for paper applications, they've actually now asked for video interviews and submissions, and they find it a really like more streamlined way to review these videos. Um, definitely, there's great opportunity to educate as tied to your mission. So just spreading any awareness about what you do through volunteer snippets, through little mission explainer videos, instead of sending somebody straight to a, a website with a lot of text um, through a link, why not share it in a 60 second video snippet to make a little bit more of an impact. Um, and then ultimately, of course, like anniversaries and milestone moments are such a great chance to recall the history of what your organization has done in the past and also share a look ahead to what you're hoping to tackle going forward. So all these make for great engagement for donors and volunteers and staff. Um, but I think like just grounding ourselves, it's really important to keep in mind that we don't always know what those storylines are unless we ask them. We don't know what stories we have to share with our audience until we put the question out there. And we see this all the time with those that we work with, that people just often want to um, share their experience, but you've got to ask that question first. And ultimately, I think why these stories have become important is because it's more than just raising the money, right? So volunteers and participants understand these stories are important ways to bring more people like them into your mission and to keep them tied to your mission when they see what that work is doing. And also because your funding realistically is only as good as the programmatic work that you can do to support it. Okay, so let me get into um, some examples here of our customers that we've seen that doing this really well. Um, and then we'll kind of wrap, round it out with some tips for success. So some of you may be familiar with Reese Across America. Um, their mission is all about remembering the fallen, honoring those who serve and teaching the next generation the value of freedom. And so one of the largest parts of this is their annual wreath laying ceremony that they do in December, where they have volunteers across the country place wreaths on headstones of fallen service members on that National Wreaths Across America Day. Uh, they have a massive amount of volume and event participation, and their reach is so widespread because it is happening in cities all across the U.S. that um, it would be really difficult to, to capture this content without having a centralized collection system. I know they even put out pictures and calls for pictures, or they put out their own pictures on social media, and members respond to those posts with pictures. But again, if you're getting thousands unless you have somebody dedicated to downloading all those photos off of that social media platform, if you even can, you're going to lose all that built-in marketing collateral. So um, for them, they collected last year, they actually were able to collect six over 6,000 pieces of content, amazingly, just from that one single day by mobilizing all their volunteers across the country. And what's pretty cool about that is just from that one day, now they have all this built-in content ready to use throughout the entirety of the rest of the year in all of their materials. A couple tactical ways about how they collected. So prior to the wreath laying ceremony, they send out instructions to their volunteers for the day, which I'm sure many of you do the same thing. And one of the things they had in the list of to do's is be prepared to share stories. You know, make sure you capture photos and videos and be prepared to share stories after the fact when we send you a link. And then afterwards in the follow-up email, they actually sent that link. Um, as well as posting the link on social media to get people who were trying to post on social media to say, hey, could you actually share it through this link as well? And then um, from the share side, they pulled all that content directly into their Canva account to then use in all their great design materials there. 
I would love to see in the chat how many of you are using Canva because I know like so many of the people we work with seem to just find Canva a total game changer for them. And um, yeah, love Canva. So, so do we. Our team uses it pretty much exclusively now. Love that, Angelique. Canva is a lifestyle. Okay, second example I'm gonna share is Slow Food Bank. Um, their, their mission is to alleviate hung hunger in San Luis Obispo County in California. And they do that by providing over 3 million meals annually. Um, as you can imagine, as many of you surely know, their volunteers are totally instrumental to helping them perform this mission. So they had two recent campaigns. One was tied to Volunteer Appreciation Week, which was in April where they featured stories on their social channels that recognized their volunteers, but also helped them recruit new volunteers by being able to explain what those volunteer jobs are in detail. So really great way to build their team on Naturally Volunteer Appreciation Week. I think anytime you can take a holiday, even if it's one of those like silly fanciful holidays and tie it into the work you're doing, the more that's gonna resonate with, their, with your community. The second thing they did was they created this great compilation of videos just saying thank you um, and highlighting some of their favorite volunteer moments, which they then shared within their network of volunteers, again, to help foster that sense of community, elevate their own community voices, and ultimately spread their appreciation for all the work that the people um, tied to their mission are doing. For them, from a tactical standpoint, they collected this content all year long. So those photos and videos were coming in from volunteers about their experiences on the ground. They did use multiple touch points as well to collect. So before volunteer events, they'd ask for some testimony. They'd also prompt actually during the event itself, um, probably a little easier at a food bank, although I don't know, there are some challenges built in there, but versus like Reese Across America, who that's kind of more of a reverent moment. It's hard to, to get them to submit in the moment. But um, if there's opportunity, like, as you have your volunteers at the food banks to be able to come in and e even if you have an iPad or can just give somebody a QR code and say, hey, go, um, can you just take a moment to stop and share your stories? That's like the way you can capture it in the moment is the best opportunity you're going to see for engagement. And they did this with really some of their seasoned volunteers who tend to work at those distribution warehouses and then go out to the food, food distribution stations. So they're like very in touch with the people and the process. Um, and they were responsible for ask, asking people in the moment to tell their story. And then ultimately, I will add that if the answer was, no, I'm not going to do that right now, that volunteer would hand out a flyer with the QR code and ask them afterwards, once they're in a better space or, you know, kind of in their own quiet privacy, could you then share your story and why it's so important to you to do this work? So really finding ways to bring somebody in who's in touch with the work that you're doing. Um, I know we've seen even people who have interns, like with a background in psychology or behavioral science, um, just to be able to approach some conversations with sensitivity, if that's something that your organization is dealing with. Um, but utilizing the people that you have as your best advocates and finding those touch points where you're already communicating with people is how you're going to see the best engagement. And then lastly, um, for Arbor Day, we um, work with Arbor Day Foundation that is dedicated to planting trees. They have more than 1 million members, supporters, and partners actually making them the largest membership organization dedicated to tree planting. And to date, they've planted trees in over 50 countries and uh, coincidentally just celebrated their 50th anniversary as an organization last year. But um, part of the devastation that came tied to their work was back in 2020, when in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, which previously or up to that point had been known as a city with really beautiful scenery, um, fabulous tree-lined streets with lots of shade, it back in 2020 suffered some major devastation when a windstorm ripped through uh, 140 mile an hour winds and tore down nearly 700,000 trees. And so Arbor Day Foundation came in as and as a part of their community tree recovery program, distributed about 800 trees to residents, and then also planted 100 trees in the streets with the help of some of their volunteers. Um, again, a lot of their work was in the moment to give three video options tied to the planet, tied to nurture, and tied to celebration. And then they also gave the opportunity to send in these photos um, showing the accomplishments of the work that the people were doing in real time. Now, when you think about tree planting, and maybe this is true for some of the work that you all do, the thinking here is you don't 
plant a tree and then unplant it uh, and show the content later to capture the story. It's just not as powerful to show the tree once it's in the ground. I think the real power comes from showing that real time footage of the shovel going into the ground and showing the person who's actually doing that manual work. So kind of my blanket encouragement there is as much as you can capture real time work, I think the more impact you're going to be able to share and the more you're gonna uplift and empower your community in the moment. And ideally, I think part of the goal is to maybe even encourage some of those volunteers to ultimately convert to donors. So kind of, um, I'll just close this out for now by saying that I think people's participation is really what helps your organization grow. But half of that is giving them a way to authentically share their experiences, even if they're remote. Um, that is the key to being able to collect these stories. Okay, now you might be wondering how did they actually do this? How did they collect all this content? And I, um, and I missed this quote here, but this just kind of paints the full picture of what, what I think stories are. They're more than just a story. They're memory aids, they're instruction manuals, and stories are moral compasses. So I'm going to hop in real quickly, just take a few minutes to show you um, the over the overview of how Memory Fox works. So you can kind of understand just from a nitty gritty level how those three organizations actually collected their content. Um, and then at the very end, I'll come back and share with you all some best practices for success and tips that we've seen work really well that you might be able to take back and implement at your own organization to collect stories. Okay, so um, when we first started Memory Fox three years ago, what we heard from the organizations we were just starting to work with was that they were challenged by three main pain points when it came to collecting story. One, that collecting content can be like uh, pulling teeth. Two, organizing that content can be very frustrating and time consuming. Sure, many of you have been there. I was certainly there when I tried to crop and save 800 photos in a couple days. And then lastly, um, just needing a more modern and efficient way to share that content back out. So we took Memory Fox pivoted it from what we were doing originally, which was collecting family mem uh, members' memories, like from pre-dementia elderly. And we pivoted to, to serve the entire nonprofit ecosystem. And we built ourselves on these three pain points as our three foundational pillars. So collect, organize, and share is the flow of Memory Fox. And really the idea here is to make it as easy as possible for you to go from this collection side to then the share side. So, Collect is simply, um, I'll show you a little run through here. This is a tool you're going to give your community just through a simple URL that you share with them or a QR code. And what it's going to do is it's going to walk them through the process of sharing exactly what kind of prompt you're asking them to talk about. So going back to Reese Across America, this was their actual campaign where they shared out that link. And what's really fantastic about it is it's intentionally made to be barrier free. So there's no app your community has to download. There's no login credentials or passwords to, to generate. It just simply lands them on this um, landing page that's accessible from a mobile device, a tablet, and a desktop computer. And it's going to walk them through the why, why it's important that you're collecting the story. The more intentional you can get about stating the why and what you're going to do with the story, the greater participation you're going to see. And then there's a couple quick housekeeping screens that allows you to collect some information. So any user demographic data that's important for you to know about the person submitting the, the um, story, you can do as many or as few fields here as you'd like, and they can be optional or required. And then ultimately, uh, um, any legal consent language you need your storyteller to agree to, to legally be able to share your story is all built in right here for you. And you can customize that language to be tied to your organization. And then once they make it through all of that, they're going to land on their calls to action here, which is you telling them specifically the question of exactly what you want them to share about. Maybe it's an open-ended question. Maybe you give them an opening prompt, like I volunteer at this organization because, or this nonprofit means a lot to me because, and have them fill in the rest. But you get to very intentionally say what you want them to share. And you can even give them instruction about what orientation on their phone you might want them to share in um, to make it uniform so you can build a piece in the end. And what's really great is when they click into the next screen here to be able to record, it's going to carry over that same prompt language at the top. So your storyteller is not forgetting what you've asked them to share about, but you're also giving them the privacy to do it in their own space, which is ultimately going to get you a really good user-generated piece of content.
From here, they can record directly in this screen. They can re-record as many times as they need to to get it just right if they forgot to say something the first time around. Um, but they also have the option down here to upload an existing video they might already have taken on their phone. Um, and they also have options if you choose to give it to them to upload a photo or if they just want to submit a text only um, testimonial in respect of not being shown on screen for like privacy reasons, that's an option as well. And then lastly, they're going to hit this screen before they submit that would just be a blank box, giving them the opportunity to like paint any color commentary, especially uh, relevant when we think about sharing photos. And once they submit that content, it is going to flow automatically to your backend dashboard or a story bank, as we refer to it. And this is what you as um, the admin tied to your nonprofit and anybody else on your team who you want to be an admin would be able to see the content populating right in here, just like a feed where the newest stuff populates at the top. But it's all categorized at the point of capture. So you have lots of opportunity to filter down and use it exactly where you need to take it offline. Um, sort it by like maybe particular like annual reports or giving Tuesdays or newsletters or things that are important for you to tag your content. So it's really easy to look for it later. And then lastly, from a share side, of course, you can download and take this content to wherever you work with it on your own device. But we do have some ways from a share side built into Memory Fox that would allow you to build some pages. So one is what we call our story pages. It's just a really simple website builder tool that allows you to pull a collection of videos and photos into a public facing web page that you can also embed into your website. Secondly, um, we have an integration with Canva, meaning you just link your two accounts one time and it will auto pull in all of your memory box uh, content exactly as it's mirrored here straight into Canva, which is a huge time saver to not have to do a download and re-upload. And honestly, our, our customers just like rave about that. And then the last thing we have that our team is super excited about because we just launched it last month is our in-platform video editor. So now you can take individual clips and kind of like crop some off at the beginning or, or clips them off at the beginning and the end. If, you know, somebody's like hitting the button to record and you don't want that in there. Um, you can also thread a bunch together to be able to, um, to be able to create one cohesive piece to then share publicly. So that's kind of the general idea of how those three um, organizations collected. Certainly, you all have more ideas about what you specifically want to do in terms of your own storytelling goals at your nonprofit and, and what you're challenged by. Um, so we definitely welcome you to find some time to chat with one of our storytelling experts. Like That's part of the fun of what we get to do is just hearing what you hope to do and figuring out ways to dream that alongside all of you. Um, I'm actually going to pass it over to Gung. We, you know, part of the reason we just love so much getting to now partner with Civic Champs is that we share a lot of those same values. And so um, I want to give him the opportunity a little bit to talk about the platform he does in terms of um, how they collect testimonials. And then we'll bring it back to me at the end. And I'll, um, like I promised, I will share those best tips for success. So over to you. Actually, here, yeah, go ahead. I'll let you share the screen there. Awesome. Yeah, no, that was that was awesome. Uh, thanks for uh, uh, thanks for sharing all of those. Yeah, like you said, you know, as I was listening, you know, I, I couldn't help but reflect on some of our previous webinars. For those of you who have joined uh, in the last couple of weeks, where we, you know, we talked about micro volunteering, right? In many ways, photo collection you can think about as a way to that sort of like an, an easy way for people to get involved with you, right? So they're not committing a whole day, but rather sharing some of those uh, memories or, or videos or um, experiences that they have. And then, you know, we talked yet last week about emotional connections with videos um, or building emotional connections as pe people are volunteering. And certainly Memory Fox, I think, really hits the spot there too. So super excited about all of that. Um, the other thing, of course, right, with Civic Champs, you know, on the screen, as you can see, uh, one of the things that we're really excited about is the, uh, the ability to allow nonprofits through Civic Champs to also collect testimonials. Uh, currently just text, right? So we don't get, have the full video and, and photo suite here, uh, which is another reason why we love uh, partnering and, and working with folks like Memory Fox. Um, and here, just on the back end, just so you, you know, for those that might be less familiar with us, Right. This is kind of how uh, that information is collected and stored on the back end. And so you could see um, on the right here, right, you can mouse over and see a volunteer's reflection um, and, and whether they were happy or not. And as a sentiment. And I think this is really powerful from a, a retention of volunteers. Right. To Natalie's point, so much of the time we focus on 
recruiting and finding new, whereas a lot of, you know, perhaps where you might get the most benefit is really um, engaging your current audience, right? But uh, as part of that, it's equally important to know, hey, if someone had a bad experience, right, perhaps you have an opportunity to reach out, engage with them, or you can filter and find all the folks that were super happy about you, right? Perhaps even um, identify who those folks are and, right, if you, in this case, you know, I clicked into the profile for uh, Sarah Abney, Right, but you can actually perhaps you know send them a customized message, right? Asking them for a video testimonial from someone like Memory Fox, right? So these are some of the ways that platforms like ours or Memory Fox can really start to work together to help deepen that engagement with uh, with your volunteers. So um, and if you know this is obviously not the only thing that we do, right? So uh, Civic Champs, we're you know for, again for those that are less familiar, we're a full platform that helps um, every stage of the volunteering lifecycle, from recruiting to onboarding to scheduling to engaging, retaining, and reporting, right? And so you know waivers management, texting and email your volunteers, um, checking in, checking out, right? All of that. So if you're interested in learning more, we'll have some details about how to reach out and, and book time. Uh, with us as well. But uh, with that, let me turn it back over to Natalie. Um, and she's going to sort of wrap us up with some key takeaways uh, from this presentation. Super. Thank you, Gang. Oops. Okay. All right. So like I promised, um, let's talk a little bit about what processes we can implement to really help us see success in running some of these story collection campaigns when it comes to video and photo. Um, because I know this is something that our the people that we work with and talk to feel the most challenged by is just like wondering, how do I even get my community to engage? Like what if I ask for photo and video and they don't submit something. So these are some ways that we share to help you really see some full participation. Um, to begin with, I think it's important to tell a diverse story. So thinking about all the, like, the different voices, the multiple angles within your community you can collect from, consider all those different viewpoints that you might want to share um, and consider how to allow somebody to share very authentically in their own space where they're not being put on the spot to be filmed like in kind of a, a polished setting, but allowing them to do it in their own space and collecting from all the different facets of the community is gonna make it really relatable content ultimately for them to share, but then for the, the people who are um, consuming it on, on the back end. Doing this also, I think, really builds trust with your audience. People need to believe what they're watching and the more authentic something is, even if there's a mess up within it, that makes it really relatable and real. Um, sim simplify is huge. So try, I think the, the more, like the less overwhelming you can make the ask, the more simple and specific it is, the greater participation you're gonna see. And so um, part of that, like I said, maybe you prompt them with the beginning of the sentence and just ask them to fill in the end. And maybe you start there and you're, you work your way up to more open-ended questions. Another thing that we see being really helpful when we talk about um, simplifying is if you can give an example at the time that you're asking for the collection, have somebody film an example for you and share that with your request so people can kind of see themselves and what the content should look like and they can see themselves in other people as well. Baking it in, baking the ask into your process is huge and probably like the biggest suggestion I would offer. So anywhere where you're already having existing touch points with your community is where you want to be asking them, like where they're engaging with you is where you want to ask them to share story. So obvious things might be like within a newsletter or on social media. Um, but there's lots of ways too that you can do this like with your volunteers. So as we talked about, maybe in the recap email, after you um, they have them come to an event, you're sending them a, a way to share story. Maybe you have that QR code or a link on site to really encourage that. Maybe you even have somebody with an iPad going around collecting the story. Um, or as we talked about in the case of Slow Food Bank, if they don't want to share it in the moment, handing them a, a little piece of paper that lets them know how they can go home and do it at a later point in time. Um, definitely, there's opportunity to message through Civic Champs and other platforms where you can talk directly to the people in your community. 
Uh, but finding ways where they're already talking to you is going to really increase that participation. And think about what it is that you want to collect and what you're already doing rather than trying to come up with some totally new system. Because what that means is then you're going to have to change minds and routines. So I would encourage you to talk to other departments, talk to other people on your team, get to know pretty intimately what they're doing. Ask them where they think there is opportunity to insert a request for story collection. Um, keeping ask short again, like nobody wants to record a long video. Nobody wants to listen to a long video. So the more you can keep it short, I think the greater participation you're going to see. Um, and then having, so we talked a little bit about real-time capture already, so I'll skip over that one. Um, but multiple touch points, I think it's easy for us to ask for something once, not get the content and feel like people don't want to participate. But I know like when I put myself in that person's shoes, like I have every good intention of participating. I just get busy and I forget about it. So there is definite value in asking multiple times, asking a second time, asking in a different space where they might see it when they're in a different headspace. Ask multiple times to get people to take that action. We talked a little bit about designating a, a point person, especially like in on per, um, in in person events, to be able to walk somebody through the part of the uh, process and help them participate and really guide them in a very hands on way. Um, the more you can find volunteers that are tied to your cause that really know your community well that you're serving, the more you're going to make participants feel comfortable. So utilize those volunteers as your ambassadors. Um, get them as involved in your community as you can. I think ultimately this is what will lead you to a groundswell. Think first person is just about like, what would you, if you were on the receiving end, what would uh, encourage you to share your story? What language would push you over the edge? What kind of story would you want to share that would actually get you to submit some sort of video or photo content? And then lastly, not everybody can incentivize participation, but if you can, there's certainly opportunity to offer something in exchange for people um, submitting some content to you. And I like to say that showing that full circle impact is almost acts as incentive in, as an incentive on its own. So when you finish building a piece of content, don't just blast it out to like your donors and forget to share it with the people who actually submit it. Go back to those people who sent you story. Go back even to the ones who didn't but that you asked if they would and show them, hey, like, thanks to you, we were able to build this really cool feature that now we get to like do a little bit of education around the programs that we host. Um, this for them is going to be create a really beautiful full circle loop to then potentially get by and either to participate again in the future, or if they didn't participate in the first time, they might realize how easy of an ask it could be and how simple participating can be. Um, and then lastly, I'll just say repurposing. I am such a huge fan of repurposing. So creating once, repurposing it often across all your different channels and breaking it down into different pieces. So when you collect story, there's ample opportunity to share it um, and not have to take a lot of time to build new story banks. So just using what you already have in all of your different channels of communication. So hopefully some of those were helpful. Um, I, I would like to just kind of move forward as we go back out into the world and have you walk away from here thinking, how can you tell your own community stories? Are there any examples you heard here today that have parallels to your own work um, that might inspire some of your own visual storytelling? Um, really, my hope is that you walk away from this session giving that some thought. And I lastly want to remind you that it is okay to fail. Failure doesn't mean stop trying. Failure is really that invitation to try again. Um, for me, what I deemed that low return rate of seven vid videos that I collected around 9-11 um, could have just led me to stopping right there. And I would have never seen that wonderful overflow of 800 photos veter of veterans being recognized. Uh, but instead, I took that, that challenge and I learned from it. And I learned what worked and I learned what didn't. And I moved on from there. And I love this really fantastic quote that Chris Miano, our Memory Fox founder, has shared with us. Failure is learning how to complete the mission. Things that go wrong help you get to the right answer. Um, for me, if I had given up sports altogether after that softball disappointment, I would have never savored this sweet, sweet moment of winning a highly competitive coll collegiate volleyball tournament surrounded by teammates and a coach who are still some of my very best friends to today. 
So thank you all so much for the opportunity to share some of this with you. And I am so eager to just hear how you go out into the world and, and start applying some of this visual storytelling as it relates to all of your volunteers, your members, your participants, your staff, and your community as a whole. And Gung, I'll pass it back on to you. So yeah, thank you so much. Um, let me reshare my screen, I guess, and we can take it from there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, first, just want to say a big thank you uh, to Natalie. Obviously, um, it's it's been it's a huge pleasure having you here on uh, today. Um, and in case folks want to reach out to Natalie or myself, um, here's our contact information. Um, you can see, you know, you uh, it's our phone number, website, LinkedIn, all of that. So feel free to reach out to us. Um, and then, uh, of course, per every uh, webinar that we do, we have a few freebies. And so the first one is actually from uh, our friends at Memory Fox. And they have a very cool uh, 12 months of gratitude Canva template. A lot of folks here were super excited about Canva, living the Canva life, uh, so to speak. Um, and so, yeah, feel free to uh, snag that QR code. Uh, we'll have this presentation also recorded and, and we'll share out the slide. So in case you don't get it, um, you'll get that in the email uh, here shortly as well. But yeah, feel free to do that. And then uh, on our end, super excited to announce that we actually just published our very own uh, and first ebook uh, for volunteer management. So um, it's a it's a guide for, for volunteer managers, hopefully uh, excellent for those of you that you might be a little bit new uh, to the, uh, you know, uh, to, to volunteer management, but also uh, perhaps a, a good refresher for uh, some of our more veteran uh, volunteer engagement folks. And then last but not least, we have, um, you know, our uh, discount. So if you are interested in learning about Civic Champs, one of the freebies that we offer is two months free for all of our webinar participants. So on the website, you'll see that usually we only offer one month free for an annual contract. Uh, but here, if you want to come uh, and book a demo with us, just uh, mention that you heard about us through the webinar um, to get this offer. And again, if you don't get the uh, uh, URL exactly, no worries. We're going to send that back out to you. Uh, and we welcome you all to join our upcoming webinar. So next week we have uh, VQ Strategies and uh, Beth Steinhorn, one of the sort of preeminent voices here in volunteer management. Uh, she's going to be joining us and talking about a you know how to rethink you know volunteer recruitment, um, and then talking about both the basics, but also you know some more advanced tips and tricks. Uh, and then the next week after that, we're going to. Uh, deep dive into what we call language market fit. And so how to really communicate, uh, you know, effectively with your volunteers, learning what language or what words that they actually use and how that's so powerful when you communicate with them. And with that, we'll open it back up to Q&A in case anyone has questions for Natalie. Um, I know we had a lot of questions throughout. So if, uh, if you have additional questions, feel free to share those in chat. Um, and yeah, I see there were some questions around putting the link in chat. So yeah, so we see, thank you to Chloe and Carly for, for putting all of that in chat makes it a lot easier for folks. Um, yeah, any other additional questions for Natalie? And otherwise we're, you know, we can certainly wrap things up. Um, thank you again, Natalie, for, for joining us today. Uh, it's been a huge, huge pleasure and yeah, hopefully everyone got a lot out of it. I was super inspired. Uh, by all of the work, uh, you know, that that uh, you shared with us. And I see, yeah, Debbie has a question in terms of, uh, do you work with Canadian nonprofits? Yeah, so we do. We do have a handful of Canadian customers that we work with, um, always expanding that, but definitely it's available in Canada. So the short answer is yes. Yeah, and Debbie, uh, same same answer for us. Um, you know, we we do work, uh, we can work with Canadian nonprofits. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Yeah, feel free to reach out. We're actually we're I, I forgot to mention this, but we are based out of Buffalo, New York. Even though I sit on the West Coast, so we're not that far away from the Canadian border ourselves. That's right. You're right. yeah. You you can you can <laughs> go right across. So. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, I, I hope everyone has a fantastic rest of the week.